Today on the Roundhouse, we're going to the land down under to talk to a loco driver with over 50 years of experience. All aboard! In days past, the Roundhouse was where the railroad worker united with the steam locomotive, each to prepare for the journey ahead. Today, it's where we examine the history, the industry, the machines, the hobby, and the passion behind railroading. News, interviews, stories, and more. So climb aboard. This is The Roundhouse. Welcome to The Roundhouse. I'm your host, Nick Ozerak, and this is episode number 54 of our trains and railroading podcast where we're talking about everything in the industry and the hobby you name it and we discuss it today we are going down to australia to talk to jim ward who is a retired loco driver with over 50 years in the industry most notably he worked for the mount newman mining company slash bhp this is kind of like the Mad Max of railroading. We're talking lawn ore trains in the high desert, including the fact that they hold the Guinness Book of World Records for the longest train ever. He has some great stories to share with us and some photos that you could check out in the show notes for this episode as well. Our guest today is a New Zealander who lives in Australia with over 50 years in the railway industry. He's worked for Mount Newman Mining Company, BHP, Queensland Rail, the West Australian Government Railways, and Horizon. Just to name a few, please welcome to the Roundhouse, Mr. Jim Ward. Good morning. How did you begin your railroading career? Well, Nick, I was one of those boys that always wanted to be a... Uh, a locomotive engineer. So I, as um, soon as I was old enough, I joined up in the days of steam in New Zealand in 1961 and just went on from there. Ended up in uh, 2014. So it's been a long ride. That is a very long ride. You were able to enter when steam was still present in New Zealand. When was steam being phased out? Was it starting by that point or did it have a much longer lifespan than it did over in the States where really by the 60s, it was gone anyway? Diesels were certainly there, diesel electrics in the 1961 when I joined, but steam finally finished in 1968. So I was lucky enough to get my driver's ticket on steam. Very privileged for that. And when you worked with Steam, what were your responsibilities? What were the kind of tasks that you had? Did you fire for them at all, or were you mainly a loco driver? No, most of my career was firing. We In New Zealand, we had many different types of steam locomotives, coal-fired and oil-fired. We learned to do them both. And, of course, New Zealand is a, a country with many steep gradients, so we run lots of double-heading, lots of helper engines, as you guys call them. It was a lovely part of the world to work, I can tell you. What took you to Australia then? Okay, in 1973, there was an, an advert, if that's what you call it, application called for qualified locomotive engineers to come to West Australia. The iron ore industry was new, relatively new, and they were having trouble getting qualified drivers. So would you believe over a period of a few years, almost 60 of us come across from New Zealand to Western Australia to operate in the iron ore industry. So since you know the specific number, was there kind of a, a family of sorts of these New Zealanders who moved specifically for this purpose? Well, it was probably that similar things were happening right around the world then too. Because diesels were replacing steam, there was a surplus of qualified drivers in New Zealand. So many of them are looking for other positions. And when that jobs came up in the iron ore industry, a lot took it. Um, I was 30 years old. I thought, well, here's a chance for a, um, a different and probably a better opportunity. Why better? Well, the wages were much better. That's for sure. Moving to, into the iron ore industry, we had a young family and there was probably would be more opportunities for them in Australia too, as they got older. So we, we crossed the ditch, as they say in this part of the world, from New Zealand to Australia. Now, the iron ore region is very sparsely populated. 
So were you living in the Pilbaras or did you have a lengthy commute to work, so to speak? No, we moved to Port Hedland. At that time had a population of around maybe 12,000 people. So it was quite a sizable town and it was growing rapidly as the iron ore industry developed. So we had, as a, after we'd been there two or three years, we had most of the facilities. We had shopping centres some. Um, and all we needed to live up there. And it was, it was just the climate was hard to get used to after New Zealand, that was all. I imagine a lot hotter and drier. It very much so, yes. We arrived there in midwinter and it was too hot for us. It's interesting that you say that the iron ore industry was really starting around that time because I would have imagined that with the resources being there that they would have been mining that for even a few decades before then. What was it about the 70s? Was it a technological thing that was causing this boom? Well, I believe for many years there was an embargo on um, on shipping iron ore out of Australia. And once that was lifted in the very late 60s and early 70s, then three companies began to set up almost at the same time in the Pilbara. There was um, Hammersley Iron, who I'm sure many of your listeners would have heard of, uh, there was a smaller group, Goldsworthy Mining Company and Mount Newman Mining, all started to set up at about that same time. Once the iron ore embargo was lifted, uh, it became very, very busy up there. You went to work for Mount Newman Mining Company. Was that your first experience with diesels or you, had you already experienced them in New Zealand? No, this was one of the reasons, I think, too, that New Zealanders fitted in pretty well. We were We were running American-built... EMDs in New Zealand at that time. We were doing multiple heading. We were using the air brake, the 26L, which they had here in, uh, in the iron ore industry. And of course, many of the guys that were coming from other railroads around the world, especially parts of Australia, had only used vacuum braking. So we sort of had, a, had to jump on them as far as the air brake went. So there were ways in which you were already used to the technology specific to North American railroading, which was being imported into the mining region. What were some of the other aspects of it that made it an easy transition or made it difficult? I imagine in particular getting used to the train length for the sizable ore runs that they were hauling took some time. It did. It did, Nick. And of course, we went from um, old English type safe working, we went straight into train orders, which was new to us. At that time, Mount Newman Mining had no CTC. It was all run on train orders. We were, and that was a little bit scary for a while. I think we operated in through till about 1976 or 1977 before we finally got centralized train control, CDC all the way down the track. So that, that was a big change from um, the old safe working systems to go to train orders but of also and also of course a big train in New Zealand would have been around a thousand tons and all of a sudden we were on to 33 or 30,000 tons which was a huge difference. It's massive. You look at videos online whether it be from your era with Mount Newman or even modern trains with BHP and it's unreal for somebody used to North American railroading where a 150 car train is really pushing it to see something that's 200 cars. And that's an average length. It was in the mid 70s that they introduced, as we called it, loco troll. I think it's referred to as distributed power in the US. And that made train handling, it actually made it easier. Although the trains were bigger, anyone who's operated trains with distributed power, the, they are a much easier train to handle with that mid-train power. That was a whole new learning curve too. <laughs> because with distributed power, the traditional way of using helper units is you have a completely separate crew, so you have to talk back and forth with them radio-wise. And now all of a sudden you have the crew at the head end in charge of all these separate units mid-train, rear, and I imagine it makes it a more automatic process as far as the train handling is concerned. Yeah, but you got far better and far quicker responses with air braking and um, handling the trains down the, the steep gradients, and we had some good gradients on the Mount Newman line too. 
that did make that a lot easier. The other thing to keep in perspective, too, for those who are less familiar with the scope of the railroading in the northwestern Australia, the distances are also really massive. It's not just the trains. The distances that you covered were fairly long. So you had some pretty long runs in there. What was your average workday like from sunup to sundown or vice versa? Yes. In those early days when we left Port Hedland, we went to Mount Newman, as it was called. There was only the one mine operating then, and that was, I've got to think, miles now, 265 miles. And it was about a 10 or 11 hour run by the time you met other trains on the run. Um, it was a long day or long night. Then we rested over in Newman for anything up to 12 hours. And then we uh, worked back on a, on a loaded train the next shift. Yeah, they, they were long. It was after what we were used to in New Zealand where perhaps 100 miles would be a big day. And all of a sudden we're doing um, two and a half times that. The motive power for Mount Newman is a rail fan favorite, Alcos. Lawrence Nienart asks this question via Facebook. He says, if I recall correctly, these were the heaviest trains run on the planet, 60,000 tons plus, five mile long trains. What special train handling was required on these runs compared to the other trains you've run? Also, Alcos were the diesel of choice, giving apparently years of great service under very harsh conditions. If you ran some of the other diesels, some SD50s and GEs, how do they compare? Well, just going back to the big, they, they ran one big test train, which has been well seen on the internet. That was 682 wagons. It was four and a half miles long in the old measurement, 99,000 tons. That was a one-off. The normal train weights in later years were around probably just a little under 60,000 tons, and they had six units spaced throughout the train, two, two, and two. They were t like um, two on the head end and then two lots of two remotes. But going back to Lawrence's question there, the, um, the Alcos would go, as I used to say, go forever. They had no modern devices on them to, to reduce power. If you were climbing a hill and they were overheating, they just kept going. And overheating was a problem in the Pilbara. But the more modern locomotives, of course, you'd get traction motor derating and... Um, all sorts of problems <laughs> climbing in the hot weather. But uh, no, the Alcos were, they were very reliable. I, I enjoyed working on them. They were uh, probably one of my favorites uh, until we got 20 SD40s imported from the States. <laughs> then they certainly became my favorite. When I interviewed Carl Belke, the president of the Western York and Pennsylvania Railroad, which to this day rosters a solely Alco fleet, the thing that he said was the reason, among many, that they choose that is because Alcos dig into a hill and they just keep digging. Would you say that's a fair assessment? Yes, that's, that is very true. I've actually seen them with steam pouring from the radiator, like a, if the older listeners remember, a Model A Ford. They used to steam. <laughs> They'd be uh, so hot there would be steam coming out of them. But they'd just keep plugging on and we'd get over those hills, whereas the modern ones are inclined to, uh, to derate, produces problems. You say that the Alcos were your favorite until the SD40s came along. Why did they become your new favorite? In my later years up there, I was involved solely in, I guess you call them construction trains. We were running ballast and running rails and we were using SD40s the whole time. I just thought they were a wonderful locomotive. They suited my era. They didn't have any <laughs> modern equipment on them. They were just a great locomotive to operate. Um, I'm sure a lot of locomotive engineers, especially in the U.S., will agree with me on that. They were, they were a great machine. We're going to be seeing SD40-2s on rails commercially for decades to come. I feel they're going to have quite the longevity. Even once the Class 1s are done with them, and they're not, then we're going to be seeing them on short lines for eternity, practically, because they are such a solid workhorse. They certainly are, yes. You were working ballast trains in the later part of your time with Mount Newman. Was that something that gave you regular scheduling as opposed to doing the ore runs? Or were there other reasons that you preferred those runs or moved into that direction? 
there was new lines were being built. BHP were opening up new mines, so there was new tracks to be built. So they had a group of us that solely went on to construction. It suited me. Uh, the hours were better. It was nearly all day shift, not much night shift at all. You virtually got on your locomotive with your with your bag, with all your overnight stuff in it, and the nearest camp you were at for that night, you tied your locomotive down and you camped. So it was a, it was a good life. I was doing it and living in Perth. I was flying in and out of Perth up to the Pilbara every 14 days. So it was 14 days on and 14 days off, and it was a, it was a good lifestyle. I'm guessing the company helped to fund these flights for you then? Yes, they were all paid for. That's right. And that must have made it easier to at least be able to plan your schedule because I know that for a lot of railroaders, that could be difficult. You kind of sign your life off to the company and then you're working the hours that the company needs you. But if you can have a predictability, then it makes it a lot easier to maintain a home life. Oh, it certainly did. And the fly in, fly out concept is, concept is very big in Australia. It's um and it suited. We were an older couple for my wife and I, so we had no children. Uh, pro- perhaps not a good lifestyle for um, someone with a young family, but that's that's for them to choose, not me. So during this time, Mount Newman Mining is bought out or becomes BHP? Yeah, it became BHP. They took over Mount Newman Mining Company. The locomotives were all painted, went from being orange to blue. And there were a few blue Alcos around for a while until they were gradually replaced by the the GE-8s that came, the CM40-8s, which again were a great locomotive. They were reliable. And now, of course, I don't think there's any Dash 8s now. It's all SD-70s, the whole fleet. But before you got to play with the SD-70s, you moved on to work with some other railway companies. What was the next railway that you ended up working for? Well, I left the Pilbara in 1997 and came down to Perth. The intent actually was to retire, but I um, I got a job on the Perth electric suburban trains. I'm not sure of the term in America for the intercity, not intercity, but around the city trains. And that was that, that was good because the hours were good. Um, you knew when you were starting, you knew when you knew when you were finishing. And I did formally retire from that in 2002. But uh, <laughs> the Freight hauling company in Perth wanted a couple of drivers to help out over the grain season. West Australia produces a lot of grain. So I went there for one season and finished up staying for um, almost five years or so. No, sorry. I went back to the Pilbara after the Perth Suburban Trains. I went back and that's when I did construction. What took you back to the Pilbaras? It was a phone call, actually. Um, A guy rang up and said, would I be interested in construction trains? And um, I said, yes, certainly would be. It was as simple as that. I knew the I knew the routes. I knew all that. So I went back up there. They showed me these SD40s that had arrived from the US, which amused me because some of them, <laughs> some of them, the gauges and the uh, instructions in the cab were still written in Spanish because I'd been working in Mexico for a while. I think uh, that was interesting. But most of them come from Southern Pacific, is it? And UP. That's where most of the SD40s came from. Did you get to experience the SD-70s at all? Were you doing any war runs at that time, or did any of the SD-70s end up in construction service? Just occasionally we got them. Not very often we had the SD-70s, uh, but we did have the AC-6000 allocated to us for ballast for or some months so we could get the heavy ballast trains over the grades. They were another magnificent locomotive to work, but sadly they've all gone as well. Let's look at the AC6000. They're an interesting study. Without going into the full history, here in the U.S., they were an experiment to continually push the amount of horsepower you could cram into a single loco. The ones that ended up on your lines, they stayed there for quite some time. How did you find that they performed? I used to um, refer to it. It was like sitting on top of a volcano, you know, (laughs) They used to rumble away, and as soon as you opened the throttle, they just seemed to tremble and shake. They were just such a powerful beast. In fact, that's what I used to call them, the beasts. No, I did enjoy working on them. They, you had sort of a great sense of power at your fingertips. They were a magnificent locomotive for that. Part of the testament to them as well is that they were instrumental in setting the Guinness Book of World Records record for the longest train in the world. 
Now, was that something that had happened before you rejoined with BHP? It did, sadly. I missed it. That was in 2001. Yeah, they used eight AC6000s, and that was the one that pulled 682 wagons and, and 99,000 tons gross weight, I think it was. That was a huge train. Just with the one man on the, um, handling the train, that, is, that was some record. Here's the facts I got on it. It was set on June 21st, 2001, between Newman and Port Hedland. 170-mile trip, 682 loaded ore wagons, 8 GE AC 6000s, almost 100,000 tons. That's insane. You look at the video, I have a link for it in the show notes. The train takes 8 minutes to pass by the camera at track speed, which was... About 40 miles an hour? Uh, yes, yeah, 75 kilometers an hour. Yeah, around, that's right, around 40, 45 miles an hour, yes. It seems like there's this pattern where you were planning on retiring and then you kept getting called back in for one reason or another. Was the driving force behind each decision to go back into the industry because you were enjoying this so much or you wanted to experience different types of trains? What were the driving factors there? Well, I guess, uh, Nick, I don't think all locomotive en- engineers could say it, but I-, I believe that I was paid for a hobby for my whole life. I, um, I've, I've just been a railway man all my life. Maybe, should I, should I say it, I love trains. You know, I love being part of it. But I thought at age 71, if I don't retire now, I, I mightn't get any retirement. <laughs> Trains were just part of my life from the day first I can remember. I won't be surprised then if down the tracks I hear that you've joined up with yet another railway company, even if it's just a tourist line or something. I won't be surprised then when I hear that. Well, yes, I'd, I'd like to do that. I, um, I would. That's, that's something I'm, I'm looking into. Here we have another listener question, this time from Patrick Carroll, who asks, what is your all-time favorite locomotive? Perhaps one maybe that you haven't even operated. Oh, Patrick, that's possibly a very hard question. I, I still seem to come back to the, to the SD40 because it was my era. Probably the younger guys didn't like them very much, but for me, it was like driving a, uh, a 1949 Chevrolet or something like that. It was um, to get into an SD40 would just... I was happy. At this point, the SD70s are the pretty much the only motive power on BHP. Maybe there's a few others I'm forgetting, but it's pretty much the primary source of power. What was your impression from the few times that you did handle those? Were they too technological for you to really get into? I think the biggest uh, thing with them is compared to the other locos I've worked on over the years, they're very quiet, they're a nice, they have a lovely cab on them, good from an operator's point of view. They were a comfortable locomotive. I only had them in ballast haulage, so uh, not in multiple. They were a nice locomotive, a nice comfortable locomotive. Among this very impressive list of companies that you've worked for is Queensland Rail. How did you end up there and what were the types of trains you were operating there? Well, QR Rail... We're running into the city of Perth when I first moved over to um, there in 2009. They were operating. We had a collection of locomotives there. We had some old West Australian L-class locomotives, which basically were an SD40 again. So I was back back on the SD40s. We had um, the occasional GM streamliner came in, not very often. And most of the other locomotives were modern GEs like they all are now, with the cab Ford, the America, uh, Australian cab, as they call it. But they were, they were good locomotives to work. And we were, I was involved in hauling freight in and out of Perth, heading east towards Kalgoorlie. And eventually that railroad became Horizon, is that correct? Yes, Horizon took over, yeah. They're quite a big company now, based in Queensland, but they have, they're operating freight trains virtually right across Australia now, in and, in and out of all the major cities. With your very lengthy history, I imagine that there were some very testing days on the railroad. What are perhaps a couple of adventures, good, bad, or otherwise, that you had work during your career? Well, in the early days of distributed power, they had um, 
what we called Locotrol 1. It was the very first and quite primitive Locotrol system, but it, it worked. Descending the, the grades on the Mount Newman line one day, the, for some reason, the remote units decided to release the brakes. I had no control at the front end. As fast as I was putting the air brakes on, the trains in the middle were pumping them off. The two locomotives in the middle were pumping them off. So um, really, I had a runaway down the grade. That was very scary. We got up to um, over 90 kilometres an hour, close to 100 kilometres an hour on a downhill grade. Um, fortunately, when the grade levelled out, we managed to get it to a stand, to a stop. But uh, uh, that was a little scary with 30-odd thousand tonnes out of control down a steep gradient with the brakes, which was I was, I was trying to apply, were being pumped off just as fast from the middle of the train. Ooh, jeez. And hopefully that was not a windy bit of railroad, because that would add to the fist clenching, I'm sure. It did. There was a crew waiting in the uh, crossing loop at the bottom of the hill. They, uh, As I swung around the curve towards them, I could see them. They were... Um, running for their lives for the hills. They weren't going to stay on that locomotive in case uh, in case my train came to grief on the curve coming into the uh, into the crossing station. It was very exciting and very scary. Fortunately, BHP and Mount Newman had a very impressive track record as far as safety was concerned. To my knowledge, there weren't a ton of major incidents or derailments or anything of that nature. Just before CTC was introduced, we had problems in the... Strangely enough, you get very cold nights in the Pilbara in the wintertime, and we had problems with broken rails, and they'd go undetected until a train hit them. And we did have a few really big pileups with, uh, caused by broken rails. Normally, the locomotives would bounce through, but then the ore cars would all pile up behind. But uh, with the introduction of CTC, of course, a broken rail would, would uh, bring up a, a red signal. So let's stop that. With all of the advancements that occurred in the industry, what were some of the ways in which the industry changed for the better or for the worse as you went on through the years? Well, I always say to people, I went from steam gauges to computer screens, and I think that sort of sums it up. In my career, and I was one of the lucky ones to be able to work steam and diesel, we are all those years ago on a steam locomotive, that's really all you looked at was the steam gauge and the water gauge and the speedometer. And then it just seemed in a flash, all of a sudden I'm sitting in a cab looking at two computer screens. Uh, that was probably the biggest change for me. There's mixed feeling here in North America about what it means to be a rail fan in the industry. Because obviously most of the folks who join the railroad industry are doing it because they want a solid career, they want the job. Some of them maybe develop the passion for it along the way, some of them don't, it's just a job. But throughout, you see different cases where, in some places, it's perfectly acceptable to be open as a rail fan amongst your fellow crew and say, yeah, this is a hobby of mine, this is something I enjoy. And in some cases, I hear stories of railroaders who are rail fans who can't be open about that with their fellow crew because of the negative perceptions that sometimes exist about rail fans. What is that attitude, that prevalent attitude in Australia? Are rail fans a point of concern or are they openly accepted throughout? I imagine obviously there's a limited amount of rail fans in the Pilbaras because of the remoteness of it, but I'm wondering what your experience with that was. Yes, Nick, you, you, that is true. The, when I was a young guy on the, on the railways, if I produced a camera to take a photo, I was laughed at. Funnily enough, years later, those same old drivers asked me, did I have a photograph from that day? He said, I remember you took a photo that day. Have you got a copy? But you weren't allowed to like the job. Maybe that's the words to use, but that is changing. I, I find that, that a lot of guys who enjoy the job are good operators. But there's a well-known guy here in, in Australia. I, I, I haven't met him. I'd love to. And that's um, Bernie Baker. And I'm sure some of your uh, listeners would have heard of Bernie. He's becoming a bit of a legend. He is a, he is a rail fan and a driver over in the eastern states and, and a great guy. But I, I think there always was a little bit of feeling between some of the, the old fellas and, and the young, keen enthusiasts. That's 
really ironic that the attitudes change, but it's good to hear that from your perspective, things are improving down there because it's always good to have this, these forms of communication open, especially in this day and age of social media where the crew of a train can be Facebook friends with the rail fan who's taking the photos and they can have those conversations regardless of distance and regardless of frequency of meeting each other. Yeah, that's true. If I am, um... If I was operating a train, it doesn't matter where it was. If I went into a crossing loop or siding and there was an enthusiast or a rail fan there taking photos, I, I would introduce myself. We'd have a chat and find out where he came from. And uh, that was my attitude to rail enthusiasts. Um, sadly, not all locomotive engineers are the same. You always get a mixed bag with any industry. It doesn't have to be rail. You always get a mixed bag. That's what I've seen. Because you had an appreciation for what you were doing. There were ways in which you could revel in the details, so to speak. One of your Facebook posts that I saw, which made me smile, was you were relating being able to explore this private observation car which Mount Newman had purchased from originally the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy Railroad that had been used on one of their Zephyr trains. And now here it is in the Pilbaras for essentially executive service, correct? Yes, that's what they bought it out for. It was sort of used as a, uh, as a luxury coach that it, it would do day trips and that. Um, sadly, I must add, it's, been, it's now a static display in Port Hedland. and it's actually a coffee shop. No, I was very fortunate that day. I was one of the first to get on board it. I wanted to have a look at it, and I am... Um, I picked up a full set of Burlington Northern and CBNQ keys that had fallen down behind the, uh, it had a kitchen area in it, and I'd gone down behind the kitchen sink. So I had a, I've still got those keys. In your free time, what are some of the ways you've enjoyed trains recreationally? Yeah, well, I've done the, uh, I've been across Australia by train. That, that's a great trip. I did enjoy that. I've done the Sunset Limited twice. I think that's what it's called, isn't it? From New Orleans to, uh, to Los Angeles. Many in New Zealand, of course. New Zealand has a good, uh, some good passenger routes to um, to travel. The what they call the Transalpine, which is a great trip over the mountains in the South Island. Oh gosh, <laughs> there's probably too many to mention. And I was lucky enough, of course, some years ago. I think I told you to get invited in the cab of 4501 in uh, Chattanooga. That was a that was a thrill of a lifetime. The uh, the engineer at the time was a young lady. Uh, I just fell to my knees and said, will you marry me? But she was already married. (laughs) The thing that I want to see that's in Australia in particular is the Puffing Billy Railway. Yes, that's a good one. I've been on that a couple of times uh, in the Dandenongs um, on the very narrow gauge in Victoria. Well worth a visit. As you look back at your career and all the experiences you've had and all the different types of trains you've been able to operate what has been the most gratifying? What were the experiences that stuck with you that made you say, I'm glad that this was my career. This is why I did this job. Oh, gosh, that is a hard one. Um, I used to love early morning side. So when you're operating a freight train, I think all locomotive engineers can relate to this. When the sun was coming up, I used to think how lucky I was to have an office to be able to see all this happening. Probably that goes down as one of my better memories. And, and funnily enough, I enjoyed the, the single manning when it came in, um, driver only, whatever it's referred to. Like for years, I worked with two man crews, which was good to have someone, but I did enjoy working alone. Um, that was probably a highlight too of the career. In what ways do you engage with the hobby now? Do you do any modeling? Do you still go out and take photos? Do you still go out on trips? You're mainly just photography now, Nick. And follow trains. I've just come back from a a vacation in New Zealand and I visited some of my old haunts and caught up with old drivers and took many railway photos. So that's my interest now. So for any listener who, regardless of where they are in the world, says, you know, Australian railroading seems to be where it's at. I love a career at it. What advice would you give them about what it means to be a railroader? Well, I guess you have to you have to want to do it to start with. Um, I couldn't imagine being a, in a job all my life that I didn't enjoy doing. I could never imagine anyone wanting to do that. 
one of the things about railroads now is that everyone, where I started in the engine sheds as a cleaner, it's all different now. They start, the young guys that want to be a, a locomotive engineer normally, I, I don't know about it in the US, but here they have to go through as a, do you call them a car examiner, like a wheel tapper, checking out trains, doing all that sort of thing for a couple of years. And maybe that takes a bit of the shine off, off it before they become a, a trainee engineman. But no, I would recommend anyone that, that ever wanted to, to get on the footplate to do it if they can. Certainly good to pursue what you love. And it's so interesting to see how much in common we have, despite being completely across the world, how there's still these similar aspects of railroading that we enjoy and these common grounds that make it so much fun. Yes, that is that is for sure. It's becoming a huge family. And of course, with the internet and with all our railway um, uh, sites you can visit now, it's certainly made it much more, brought it out much more out in the open. I think people used to look upon the <laughs> people who like trains has been a bit strange a few years ago, but I think we're much more accepted now. And we can connect to each other so much more easily. I couldn't have imagined... 15 years ago, having the ability to talk to somebody like you and have a conversation about this stuff. It just, the resources weren't there. And now we take for granted how easy it is to to be able to explore all of these different facets of railroading and engage with them. And it's great because I've learned so much from you here about what your career was like. And now I have a totally new appreciation when I go into my train simulator and I fire up the BHP route that takes me from the sea mining area down to Port Headland, what it was like for you when you were doing that for real. Well, yes, and there's a couple of good steep grades as you come out of Area C too. And it's, it's an interesting track and quite a, a scenic one. Not that the Pilbara is very scenic, but it is quite a scenic track out of there. I feel quite honoured to be that you called me. I'm feel privileged to be able to talk to your listeners, so, um, so thank you for that chance. The Pilbara seem like the Mad Max of railroading. That's the appeal to me anyway. Jim, thank you so much for joining us here in the Roundhouse to share what your career has been like, and hopefully those of you joining us here as well have learned a lot. Jim sent me some photos, and I'll have links in the show notes. You can see his photos. They're really interesting from a history perspective, from a, an aesthetic perspective, just seeing these long trains around the curves, oh, that is something. Jim, thank you so much. And thank you, Nick. And, and um, thanks to the listeners. And now, the question of the day. Before we get to the question of the day, I just want to point out, we've passed two years of the Roundhouse. That's right, back in... February of 2015, we released the first episodes, and here we are two years later, over 50 episodes, and man, it has been quite an adventure. I want to thank you guys for being part of that adventure. As always, it's great to continually hear more of your stories as we do these question of the day segments, as we talk to people like Jim. It is such an amazing opportunity to be able to do this, so I thank you guys for that very much. It was Christmas last time on the Roundhouse. We were covering the Western New York and Pennsylvania Railroad's Santa train for 2016. And I asked you guys, what is a favorite railroad holiday memory for any holiday, not just Christmas? Lots of interesting stories shared. This from Facebook. John Hillier writes, actually, coolest memory I have is working the New Year's Eve trains when it was between 10 and negative 4 degrees Fahrenheit and a crystal clear night in the Animas Canyon with my own train. At that time, I was working on the Durango and Silverton Railroad. I've worked for a few others since. And from the roundhousepodcast.com, Andrew Dietrich writes, my favorite holiday railroad memory is working the Everett Railroad Company's Easter Egg Express trips as a train crew member slash car host. There's nothing like getting cinders in your hair and your steel toe boots dirty from an honest to goodness steam locomotive. Your question of the day for this episode is what is the longest train that you've ever seen? Let me know at the roundhousepodcast.com. We have our links to social media there, Facebook, Twitter, and we're on iTunes. So if you like this show and you want an episode delivered to your phone 
every single time we release one, no problem. You can subscribe for free and leave us a review if you enjoy what we do here on the show. Thank you guys for listening. And remember, as always, that the roundhouse is our house. <laughs>